a man who doesn't know how to smile doesn't know how to live, I think. <laughs> well, no, but it's a version of the old Chinese uh, thing as a uh, man without smile should not open shop. Exactly. Well, man without smi smile should not open mouth. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take that one. Welcome to the Humorology Podcast with me, Paul Barros, and my glittering lineup of guests from the worlds of business, sport, and entertainment, who are here to share their wisdom and their use of humour with you. Humorology is the study of how humour can dramatically improve your business and your life. Humorology puts the fun into business fundamentals, increases the value of your laughing stock, and puts a punchline back into your bottom line. Please remember to like, subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. My guest on this edition of the Humorology podcast is a legendary award-winning producer of classic comedy. His long and laughter-filled career has created a collection of high-quality comedic hits and was capped when he became the head of comedy for the BBC. From Wogan to French and Saunders to Absolutely Fabulous and the Vicar of Dibley, he can produce powerful, poignant and punchline-packed programmes that are sure to please the public. As an executive, he is responsible for an era of award-winning and crowd-pleasing comedies, including The Office, Little Britain and Shooting Stars, just to name a few. His brilliant book, How to Produce Comedy Bronze, offers a deep dive into his legendary career of cultivating a culture of comedy. John Plowman, welcome to the Humorology Podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Now, I absolutely loved your book, How to Produce Comedy Bronze. So did I. And... <laughs> But it really did make me laugh out loud. And, and the first right. thing that made me laugh out loud was, was the lovely Dawn French, who does a wonderful, glowing introduction to the book. I and, wouldn't uh, say glowing. I wouldn't say glowing. I mean, if well, you look at the, her, her first words are, John Plowman is a twat. Um, <laughs> which well, is in the... some people might think is glowing. I, I'm not among them. Well, in the a total twat. And on the well, front it, cover, she says, this is absolutely and very definitely a book. <laughs> well, in the comedy world, is there any higher form of praise than one of the comedy greats insulting you? No, no, you're right, you're right. Being insulted is, is amongst the um, good things about knowing people in comedy. <laughs> well, well, for people, we, we get um, listeners from all over the world, John, and, uh, and some that's people all over the fault. world. That's not yeah, my it's problem. Not your fault. Sorry, that's your problem. It's not my problem. Exactly. But they, that they should understand that in Britain, uh, you know that somebody really loves you when they completely insult you. Yeah. Well, I suppose if I have a theory... And I don't really, but it, but I can drum one up when this when needed. Um, it's that comedy is partly about surprise. So, you know, you you meet somebody new, you go along, you expect to shake their hand and everything to be nice. So if they then insult you, it's a nice, well, not always nice, but it's a good surprise. And surprise being at the heart of comedy, but you know, changing the expectation is is what good comedy does funnily enough in the book you said laughter is registering a shock and therefore it yeah. creates a receipt of release that's right laughter is a is a feeling it is a degree of acceptance isn't it you feel hooray everything's okay because they've laughed at something i've done or they've just laughed in order to be pleasant um laughter is a feeling of acceptance so the ultimate acceptance is uh, Insult. insulting something. Funny. <laughs> it's funny though. It's a very English thing. It's 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 English and slightly American. But but there's a there's always an edge in America. They're never quite sure what you're doing. 
I, it's an English thing to insult a person before you're nice to them. I'd like to go back to your youth. Um, it was, <laughs> was funny, was comedy valued in your family? It wasn't particularly valued in my family, but it was certainly valued at school. You know, I went, I went to, um, I went to a local grammar school um, when local grammar schools existed, and and I suppose comedy was how I got by. You know, I, I knew I I was a relatively scrawny kid. I knew that at the first. Um, you know, at any moment I might get beaten up by bigger kids or or poked or whatever. So if you can make a joke and, and make people laugh before they punch you, uh, hence punchline, I guess, um, then it's an advantage. And so comedy, yeah, comedy was, I, I began doing comedy at school, I suppose. So is that when the passion really came to the fore, or you just realised it was a powerful tool? When I started in television, I didn't start in comedy. Uh, I very first started at Granada Television in Manchester on a, a, a Saturday morning kids show called, um, rather ironically perhaps, Fun Factory. Um, it was a sort of summer substitute for a show called Tis Was, um and and my job was just was to put on a a, a, a highly colored boiler suit and herd kids around for two hours on a Saturday morning <laughs> in view of the cameras uh, and after that I had to work on the news and after that I worked on arts programming and after that I worked for a man called Russell Harty and after Russell I worked for Terry Wogan and only after Terry who himself it was, possibly, you know, one of the funniest men I've ever met. But anyway, only after that did I get to work in comedy. I don't think it was that I, I, the time doing Wogan, I thought, oh, if only I could work on comedy. It's just, it just sort of happened. I, from university, I'd known a guy called Richard Curtis. When Comedy Relief first happened, the first Comedy Relief, Seven Hours Live, which Richard took a huge, a huge risk in doing, uh, I apparent Richard sent me a note. I sent Richard a note saying, "Well done for doing seven hours live television." L ignore the money raised. Obviously, that was a great thing, but but the achievement I thought was doing seven hours live comedy. Uh, so I sent him a note, and and afterwards he said, "You're the only person who sent me a note." So I wonder, could you, would you like to work on the next one? <laughs> so I, and in a way, I dug my own comedy grave <laughs> well good but since then and uh, I, you've been involved in so many hit comedies do you think that you can be a great communicator without understanding humor no it may seem a stupid thing to say but i can't see the point in being a great communicator without humor you know humor seems to me a fundamental you know, comedy is a thing which teaches us how to live. Uh, you know, you look at, I don't know, look at Basil Fawlty beating a car in impatience. Now, he's going too far. He's going too far, and the going too far is what makes us laugh. And, uh, you know, so I think comedy is about humanity, really. And I, I see no difference between the two, and I, and I think it's a vitally important aspect of life. What about those people who don't get it? What 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 are they missing in in their lives? What are they? Well, they're missing they're missing a chance to understand people. And and I would say, what if you say what about those people? I say, ignore them. What in every aspect of life? You, but, no, do you I'm actually slightly? Okay, I would say show them the error of their ways. Uh, and I would also say. I absolutely understand that not every show that anybody makes is for everybody. Uh, you know, some things are for one audience, other things are for a different audience. Uh, some people, you know, like Mrs. Brown's Boys, some people hate Mrs. Brown's Boys, some people prefer high-end stuff. You know, it, it's just a question, there is taste, but 
I don't know. A man without a man who doesn't know how to smile doesn't know how to live. I think. <laughs> well, no, but it's a version of the old Chinese uh, thing: as a uh, man without smile should not open shop. Exactly. Well, man without smile, smile should not open mouth. <laughs> <laughs> We'll take that one. Go for it. Um, now, I know, having uh, read your brilliant book, I, I know that you've often done studio warm-ups. There, there ladies true. and gentlemen. But I, look, let's be honest. I, the only reason I did studio warm-ups was because the first sort of out-and-out -out comedy show, I suppose, I did was Dawn French and Jennifer Saunders' third series. They'd, uh, they'd sort of got bored with Jeff Posner, who <laughs> produced the first two series. And, 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 that, and so I, I got a call out of the blue saying, might you be free to? So first, the first show we do, I do what every producer does, which is to employ a warm-up guy now. It should be confessed that the warm-up guy I employed wasn't very good, but it, that was just to do with dates and times, and, you know, he wasn't very good. At the end of the evening, uh, Dawn and Jennifer came to me and said, if that guy's on next week, we're not. <laughs> uh, and so <laughs> I realised that I had to employ a different warm-up guy. Maybe rashly, I said to them, look, if you help, you know, because I knew that they, what happened before, immediately before an audience show is the girls are in makeup, getting made up and costume for the first sketch. So they've got a, a tiny bit of time in their hands. So we we sort of developed a routine where they would interrupt me on the off-stage mic uh, and, and send me up. You know, they would say, oh, for God's sake, John, get on with it. These people don't want to hear from you. Uh, I mean, they were absolutely right. Uh, and so it became a way of, of doing it. And I always thought, actually, being on the floor, doing the warm-up with the audience was better as was a better use of my time than pacing up and down in the gallery saying, why can't we get on with it? What's going on? Come on, come on, go on. You know, it, it, it's just, it, it's, a, it's a better use of my skills if I have any. So what advice would you give to people? Because obviously not all our listeners are, uh, are, are comics. What, what, what would you advise to, for normal speakers, people doing weddings, people doing business speeches, to get humour to work? I would say a slightly unusual thing, maybe, which is don't try and do jokes. I think jokes are sort of the enemy of good comedy. I think good comedy is about truth and it's about character and it's about expressing who you are. It's not about set up gag, set up gag. Now, there is a, a va there are a vast number of people across the Atlantic who absolutely believe that the comedy is about jokes, and and American shows are sort of written like that. So I've I've sat in an American showrunner's room, and and been part of them putting the script as it is on the on a, on a screen. Doing the first, okay, that's the first line. Anybody got a better second line? And you go through the script and you try and improve on, which means you get a set up joke, set up joke, set up joke. I don't think that's right because I think jokes, I think people's, if you're doing a wedding, let's say, your audience is in a good mood, hopefully. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, no, they're really, <laughs> yes, exactly. Cross figures. They're in a good mood. They want to have a nice time. They they want to laugh, probably, uh, maybe apart from the bride. Um, and so if if you do, I don't know, this sounds like terrible advice, but if you do, as it were, observations and and 
anecdotes rather than gags, you'll get a better response. Because you'll get the response of, as I say, surprise, uh, rather than that forced thing. Of, you know, people do a gag and, and the audience think, oh, I see, I'm supposed to laugh here. But if you're not a trained comedian, I mean, trained by experience rather than that there is a training you can do, but if you're not a trained comedian, you will go down like a, a bucket of cold sick. No doubt about it. So it's being in the moment, and it's isn't it? Because one of the things that I always talk about is actual listening. So you're yeah. gauging Absolutely what the right. audience Just is, and you're talking to what about. the audience are enjoying. Uh, and and if they're enjoying, if they're not enjoying you, get off. <laughs> Exactly. Well, it's it's about being conscious of, of what's going on. Yeah. And having yeah. worked for so many years in comedy, I think the best comedians are the ones who really listen. And yeah. if somebody yeah. says something in the audience or murmurs or does something, comment on it, Make, make bring yeah. it in. Yeah, to that. absolutely right. I remember the what maybe the most difficult one was the, there was a night on one of the series with Dawn and Jennifer when Jennifer had done her back in and was at home. She wasn't even in the building. She was at home on her back, she said. Uh, and I said, well, look, if you're going to stay there on your back, the very least you can do is is a, a sort of phone call live into the audience to apologise for the fact that you're not here. And if you can sound pained, that would be good. But it meant that we'd only got Dawn. There was Dawn... And and anything, you know, the way Francis on sort of sometimes worked was one of them would do a sketch, the other one would be changing for the sketch after that. So there was a, you know, you didn't you didn't have to. There wasn't too much fill in to do, but on a night where one of them isn't there, <laughs> you can only, you know, you've only got fill in really. So in the end, what we did was and and was show um sort of old things from that series <laughs> to the audience you know to show them, show it on the monitors because the let's be honest the audience who've come to see dawn french and jennifer saunders don't want to see me or you even <laughs> That's true. Uh, you know they want to see the stars they don't want to see some guys being employed to try and make them laugh because they won't you know it, they're not going to laugh. So, John, what makes you laugh? Um, I, I tell you what, I, here's an unscrupulous piece of advertising. Mel Brooks' book, All About Me, which I am currently reading, makes me laugh. Uh, Mel Brooks makes me laugh. Woody Allen makes me laugh. Um, I think somewhere in the back of my heritage, it, there was something Jewish, because Jewish people... I think Jewish people uh, have have funny bones, as it were, and and there's something about. So can I, uh, there's a tiny bit. Let me. There's a tiny definition of the difference, uh, if I can find it. But yeah, between comedy and tragedy. This is reading from Mel's book. Somebody getting hurt is always funny. Later, as the two thousand year old man with Carl Reiner. I explained the difference between comedy and tragedy. If I cut my finger, that's tragedy. If you walk into an open sewer, fall down and die, that's comedy. <laughs> so if it happens to me, it's tragedy. If it happens to you, it's comedy. I don't mean that seriously. It just a, 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 a gives you the idea of, of how that, comedy out of tragedy comes maybe maybe and um, what i like maybe um are people who laugh at tragedy rather than it uh rather than cry at it well yeah it's a choice at that point isn't it it's, yeah uh, it, it's all but they, i mean the classic is of course that comedy is tragedy plus time so yeah. everything can be funny at that point well comedy is tragedy plus 
and an open sewer. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you're not falling in it. Yeah, um, exactly. As long as it's the other person falling in it. Yeah, exactly. Well, talking about the, those then, tell me a true funny story about something that's happened to you. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, well, I had to do warm-up for French and Saunders. Um, <laughs> well, here's a, here's a notionally funny thing. Two people walk into my office. One was a tall, thin guy, and one was a short, fat guy. And they... The, the tall, thin guy had been doing the BBC director's course and the short, fat guy had been in a band but hadn't really, as it were, made an impact. And they got an idea that uh, they... And I knew this before they walked in, they'd sort of touted around to everybody. Uh, and they showed me a, the beginning of of the idea that they met they made a short piece and the short piece was the short fat guy um trying to get somebody into the to his company without doing the required safety exams to do with uh forklift trucks uh at one, at one point he says um forklift truck exams i write them and he does a, a Pinocchio nose. And the funny thing, in a way, is that those two people were Ricky Gervais and Stephen Merchant. The show they were offering me, to which I unbelievably said yes, <laughs> or maybe not, the, the show that they offered me was The Office. Um, and Ricky says to this day that what I said was, look, it's fine, but I don't understand why this company employ this guy, um, David Brent, who's, 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 you know, incompetent, not very good at his job. Why do they employ him? And he said, John, can I take you for a walk around the BBC? <laughs> and, and, the implication was he was going to show me people similar to David Brent in every department of the BBC. He may have been right. <laughs> Will that do? No, that's perfect as well. It's and and the, funny thing, but the funny thing, at least from my point of view, was it made both of them gazillionaires. Me, the person who said yes, I made nothing. We took it to the controller of BBC Two. At the time was a lady called Jane Root. Uh, and she worried about it a bit because she was worried that at the time there were quite a number of shows on BBC Two that were the horrible word docu soaps. They were things like, you know, hotel, shop, <laughs> airport. <laughs> Uh, airport, yes. They were they were documentaries spun out to a number of weeks in which tried to make characters out of the ordinary people working in ordinary jobs. And hooray. And she was slightly worried that if the office caught on, it would kill off these shows. <laughs> I'm not sure that it ever did kill them off, but, but to her credit, she was the person who... The first series went out at the end of August, which is pretty near death for most shows, went out uh, at the end of August and went through to September. And it it started uh, sort of here, and then it went down, and then it went, sorry, I'm, I'm doing things for a podcast that you can only see if you can see my hands. I will try to do them without mine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so it did quite well on its on its first week, not great, but quite well. And then it dipped, which is what all comedies do in numbers. And then it sort of dragged along the bottom. But then, and this was Jane Root's skill, she noticed that in its last couple of weeks, it picked up a little bit. Now, most shows don't do that. Most shows get their best audience in episode one, and if they're okay, then it goes down a bit for episode two, and then it 
starts gradually going up a bit, if you're lucky. Uh, the office didn't do that. It just went along the bottom and then picked up. And it picked up enough for her to think, hang on, maybe this is word of mouth. This is people watching it, realising what it is and getting an act. Because, you know, a show called The Office sounds like the hotel and there's no reason why the office should be funnier than the hotel um uh, but she had the courage to repeat it within about two and a half months which is unheard of really and the repeat doubled its audience it doubled the audience it had got on the first time out now most shows don't do that so it was a it was a sign of faith on her part and and faith that the audience kind of came to it god that's an amazing story and it's uh, <laughs> and and i still think that uh, R- ricky and Stephen owe you a drink don't they i think they no they don't owe me a drink they owe me a large amount of money let's be honest <laughs> <laughs> well I'll send this clip to them and see if we can be of any help uh, yeah no, no. Fine. um is everyone potentially funny, John? Or is it a gift given from God? Those are those are particular alternatives, aren't they? No, not everybody is funny. It's not their fault. They're just not. It just some people have a serious view of life, which doesn't include uh, humour. It's sad but true. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sort of sorry for them. Well, no, I am sorry for them. Is it a gift given from God? Well, I suppose, as it were, to be Les Dawson is a gift given from God. Uh, but to to have some comic naps, to be able to make your friends laugh, it, it is, is shared more equally. Let's put it that way. So do you think, I mean, you've worked with, you know, so many of the greatest comedians in the I've world. I've worked with some people who... Who weren't the greatest comedians? Well, I mean, that's... <laughs> well, yeah, but I'm not interested in them, John. To be no, honest, no, <laughs> no, you're. Uh, I'm interested in why the hell they got a series in the first place. But anyway, let's not go. All right. Well, well, actually, that going on that point, why do people fail to be funny then? Well, I think it's some of it is sometimes arrogance. Some of it is sometimes misjudging how an audience will, will react to something. It, you know, it's, yes, of course, if you do a comedy series on television, if you're lucky enough to get it, you've got to believe in yourself. Of course you have. But that doesn't necessarily mean you haven't got to put in a lot of work to make it the thing as funny as it can be. And I think it, there are, there have, I have been known to work with the odd person who, as it were, had more self-belief than than was perhaps uh, they were perhaps uh, entitled to, to put it that <laughs> and way. Their talent warranted, and they didn't. They and their talent warranted, and maybe they didn't put in the work that was necessary to make a thing work. And I don't know why. You know, I, I cannot tell you. There, ha- there have certainly been shows which I was convinced were an absolute surefire hit. I remember a show, I didn't make it, Jeffrey Perkins made it, but the two of us talked about it before it was recorded. And I think, in looking back on it, I think, I'm not going to tell you what it is, but I think it was slightly miscast. I think the leading guy just kind of played it slightly wrongly. And so the audience didn't take to him and it as much as they should have done. I can't tell you why things don't work. I can I can tell you when they don't. Uh, only but you know I can tell you by that the, when they don't by standing with my back to the audience and hearing them not laugh. <laughs> So how do you make your decisions? Like, in, uh, for instance, in casting, is it all gut whereby you actually go, this person's got it, that, that special something? 
most probably most times it's got. I remember when we were casting, and I only say this because he sadly recently passed away. When we were casting the Vicar of Dibley, it we saw a lot of very good actors. Richard had just done Four Weddings and a Funeral. It had been a huge hit. This was his next project, as it were. Uh, and so we could sort of see anybody. And we saw people who'd taken leads at the National. We saw people who'd been leads on television. We saw good, serious actors. We saw good comic actors. But it was a, it, it was a curiously hard part because what Richard had written was, on the one hand, a sort of comedy bigot, as it were. In, in I'm sorry, in David Horton was the part that we had trouble casting. And David Horton was the part we could we saw a lot of people for. And and we just couldn't find amongst all these really good actors, we couldn't find somebody who kind of knew how to tread the line between kind of bigot and and somebody the audience would like enough. Does that make yeah. sense? Um we saw Gary Waldon relatively early in the process, but we thought maybe it was a bit of a sort of comedy turn. He'd done quite a lot of comedies, and uh, and so we we were prejudiced against him, really. But there is a skill. There's a skill in knowing how to play a line, in knowing how to play a part, clearly. Having seen a lot of people and not found anybody, we got Gary back, and we got Gary back with Dawn. And and we saw that he was the guy. He he abs- he had the skill. There's a skill about being able to do a line, and for that line to be funny. I don't know what it is. I only wish I had it. Well, it, it is something because you know I think you hear funny from a yeah. young age. I think it, yeah. it's something that's yeah, inherent. Absolutely. You hear a rhythm. You hear how. Mm how it works and then you work on it and well, you, you hear that they you hear that they've understood the rhythm that they need to make the yeah. thing my dog's got no nose how does it smell bloody awful or as i learned from national lampoon the canadian version of that joke which is my dog's got no nose how does it smell it can't <laughs> Sorry, I apologise to all people listening in Canada. <laughs> no, but but it is about the understanding. Of, uh, I think it's a rhythmic thing. I think it you yeah. hear where the funny yes. comes, Absolutely and instinctively, right. um, both of us knowing tons and tons of funny people. It's it's kind of like your brain is always whirring and you're unpacking what you're yeah. hearing constantly and going, yeah. I know a line here, is that appropriate? And you're here. I, I was uh, listening to Lee Mack be interviewed and I kind of uh, thought that what he was describing was similar to what a great sports person was describing, that everything starts to slow down on on that stage, whether it's on a pitch or on a thing, and you start to see things happening in slow motion, and you have loads more time than everybody else. And yeah, absolutely right. And he described it as that uh, that he can't believe that nobody else has done the line. So after a while, he says, "I might as well say it," which just <laughs> yeah, shows. Very good. Yeah. How how the comedy mind works when it's at that moment, and we all have those moments. Well, those of us lucky enough to uh, to to do it, whereby it's just working. You can hear yeah. it. You can absolutely think. right. So maybe it is a gift given from God. Yep. Okay, I'll go with that. What would the world be like without any humour? Sad. Well, you could say it would be like the world we're currently living in. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) You could. It would be a very sad place. I'm not sure I'd want to kind of carry on living in it. It, uh, 
humans what gets us through, isn't it? I mean, humans what makes us, okay, cast your mind back or cast your parents' mind back to World War II. During World War II, there was a lot of comedy on the radio and a lot of great comedians came out of the army and came out of radio at the time. You know, the goons came from there. And they came from there because it was a bad time, because during a bad time, people needed a laugh. They needed to be told that the world wasn't entirely awful. Yes, of course it was awful, but it wasn't entirely... There were still these people out to make them laugh. So, my God, we need it. So it's a coping mechanism in your it's view. It's partly a coping mechanism, and it's partly a... a <laughs> It's partly giving us the, the means to get through things. Yeah, I mean, that is coping, sorry. Uh, but, but it's sort of saying, look, you could laugh at this. Another way of looking at this, another way of looking at this prime minister who won't get leave his job, he may have left his job, listeners, by the time you're listening to this, in which case I apologise. But the way of coping with that might be just to laugh at it, if it weren't so tragic. But anyway... But, yes, it is a coping mechanism. Well, we're recording this um, while Boris Johnson still has a job, folks. Um, but uh, do you think <laughs> that that is ultimately, and it's an interesting point of ultimately what might destroy him is people mocking him and laughing at him. Yes, and it might also be that he thinks he's funny when he's not. So the arrogance also, comes in. Yeah, the arrogance of thinking one of the reasons people like me is because I'm funny and because I'm prepared to tell lies might be his undoing. It, it, it'll be interesting to, uh, to actually watch this out because that's what I'm fascinated by, it'll the whole thing. Interesting. It'll either be interesting or tragic. <laughs> uh, well, it'll be tragic first and then it'll be comedy, won't it? Yeah, very good. Yes. <laughs> Do you how important because it goes back to that thing? How important is it to be able to laugh at yourself? It's very important. It, of course, it's important because it, it goes back to the idea of being able to cope. As you know, be, laughing at tragedy, which may be what you are. <laughs> you see what I mean? Um, yeah. l- laughing at your position. Uh, laughing at what's happened to you, laughing at your circumstances, fantastically important because it's a coping mechanism. It's how we survive. So do you think as somebody who can't laugh at themselves is is actually uh, missing a trick in, in their yeah, life armoury? But I would say a man that has not humour in him uh, is not to be trusted. Ah, you'd go as far as that. Yeah. Um, I think it's um, important. But there's different kinds of humour, isn't it? Isn't it um, yeah. self-deprecating humour is yeah. uh, important, but humour can also be cruel, can't it? It can be a, a bully's um, yeah. remit as well. Yes, I, I mean, I think the cruelty of humour is important. You know, the cruelty of being able to laugh at the man falling down the sewer while you've pricked your own finger. Uh is is a tragedy is important but cruelty that actually if um is tough on the target as it was you know that actually says look at this person they're pathetic and horrible if they're not pathetic and horrible uh is is a, a very bad use of comedy comedy that says look at this person they're uh, you know, only just the side of Goebbels uh, is, is sensible. Well, then, then we're getting into the realms of pricking the bubble of pomposity, isn't yeah, it? Using it, right. to, yeah. the, uh, using it for uh, good in that sense. Yeah, yeah. no, I think, uh, I think that's very important. You've spent your life um, facilitating, if you like, people being creative. Yeah. Um, a lot of our listeners obviously don't work in television, don't work in the media. How do you um, best facilitate creativity in any business workplace? 
let it happen. Don't stop it. Even if you think people are going in the wrong direction, if you think they're going totally in the wrong direction, then at least advise them. But if they're being in the least bit creative, let them do it to them. And, and maybe there'll come a point when they are going in the wrong direction, but let them, let them go with it. You know, don't jump in and think you know better because it's just possible that you don't. And it's important to know that you don't. So basically, you have to allow them to play, have to I, allow them yeah, to make absolutely. mistakes. Yes, absolutely right. And and don't get in their way. <laughs> well, but, but that's actually a really important point, isn't it? Because isn't yeah. the, the knowing when to shut up is as important. Absolutely right. It's as important as, as not shutting up. <laughs> no, uh, you know, but because you may miss the next great thing if you go yeah. okay i've heard yeah. enough of that or yeah. the idea because how many times have you been in a room whereby the idea is really terrible until it becomes brilliant it makes that yeah. sort of That's strange right. leap quite often <laughs> yeah uh you know there's a moment when you suddenly think yes okay i can see where you're going with this i mean there are some moments when you can't see and you continue not to be able to see and maybe that's when what you're paid for is to uh, stop people making a terrible m mistake but let them go as far as you can well i think that's brilliant advice actually um, so if I asked you to write a business case for why humour uh, would be involved in any business, I mean, I'm talking every business. This is not yeah. the world of comedy. No. A business case for why you should have humour, what would you include in it? I'd say that it's not fair on any of your employees or your, or your business to not allow humor and, you know the the company that says i'm sorry look we're not doing jokes between nine and five is is the company that's dead i think or if not dead at least on the way i you know it's vital it's a human you know it's part of humanity it's a thing that leads us to understand ourselves and and to make ourselves better you know you you can watch uh i don't know what i go back to basil 40 watch basil 40 beating his head against a, a a table uh at the wrong moment for the wrong reason for a reason that's to do with ego and you learn something about humanity you learn something about people bosses you don't have to be the boss of a bad hotel in uh, talky to understand what Basil's doing wrong. Yeah, and and it, so there's lessons to be learned. Um, but the trouble is that most companies want a return on investment. What do you think the return on investment on allowing comedy to happen is? Well, a, a, a much bigger return than not allowing it, said the man who knows nothing about business. But But I know something about the business we call show. I think you know a lot about that business, John. <laughs> You're an absolute expert and legend in that business. Have you ever taken, and I suspect the answer is yes to this quite clearly, taken a joke too far or crossed the line? Yes, I'm sure I have. Most of the times I've done jo jokes when I was nervous about a situation I was in, you know, the, in my business, the point at which you go and pitch a show to a controller is when you're essentially walking in and saying, please give me uh, half a million pounds for six episodes of this thing. And that's always nerve wracking. It can be a point at which you go too far in trying to make the thing a humorous event. In other words, you know, going in and asking somebody for half a million quid 
<coughs> essentially isn't a humorous event. Uh, but uh, pitching a comedy that will need half a million quid to survive um, sometimes brings out nerves that make you go too far. We were pitching, I, I can't remember, I, something to do with the League of Gentlemen <clears throat> to Mark Thompson, who was then controlled of BBC Two. And at one point I said to him, look, Mark, if you don't go for this, we'll just go to Channel 4, and that's that. Now, that was, you know, I was head of comedy at the BBC, for God's sake. I wasn't going to pitch a show to Channel 4, and, and he must have known that, and I must have known that. But I clearly did it in such a um, serious tone uh, that he then said, OK, look, I'm stopping these, this meeting. I'm, I'm you know, I'm, and he walked out. Um, he walked back in again a bit like, when he calmed down. But, you know, it, yeah, you have to be careful. You have to pick your moment. I'm interested because you, you introduced the topic of nerves and uh, a lot of uh, people who listen to the podcast write in and, and say, how do you deal with nerves? Because I think they presume that uh, the stars that you work with, or, or uh, you know, some of the biggest names in the comedy, comedy firmament, have no nerves. But everybody, I say, there's two types of people in the world: those who get nervous and those who are liars. You know, mm. it, but You're absolutely right. My partner who's downstairs um, had a, a brain. Um, had an accident, uh, got knocked off his bike. It involved uh, some um, a, a seven-hour brain operation, which eventually was fine. Um, and after it had happened, the surgeon said, oh, uh, you know, this is days after, said to him, um, oh, I never asked, what, what do you do? And he said, oh, I'm an actor. And the surgeon said, oh, God, you're brave. I could never do that. You think, no, hang on. This is a man who's just spent seven hours poking around in somebody's brain, had to know the right bits from the wrong bits, says he can't be an actor because it involves nerves. I mean, no, nerves are steel. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Isn't it funny? But I always think that it's uh, the things we are more nervous about are the things that we can't do. It's yes. uh, everything, and, you know. And, uh, we're, yeah. And we're also yeah. more impressed by things we can't do. You well, know, we're, more you by to... the, we're more impressed by the people who can do the things we can't do. You know, yeah. I am very, very impressed by pilots. I, I'm not keen on flying, but I, I have to do it from time to time. I'm slightly nervous flying. I'm, I'm full of admiration for people who can uh, sit up there and uh, take something up to, you know, 35,000 feet, take it across the Atlantic and land it. Well done, them. I could have <laughs> Well done, them, indeed. Um, what What about um, performance and nerves? Have you, I, I mean, we both know people who get massively nervous before. Rick Mail is the classic example. When we were doing Bottom, which was Rick Mail and Aid Edmondson, uh, we would do a studio. We did two days in the studio on that show when they were, when they were as it were, setting fire to each other's farts or hitting each other over the head with saucepans. There were things which had to be pre recorded because they were, as it were, too risky or too difficult, uh, camera wise, to be done on the night in front of the audience. So we'd record that. And then on the second day, we'd do a run through of what we were going to do in front of the audience. And at the end of the run through, Rick would always say, uh, if you've got any notes, uh, give them to aid because I'll be in the dressing room throwing up. Uh, his, he was incredibly nervous until he, as it were, walks out of the wings onto the onto the studio floor. And then he was entirely and utterly alive. I, I cannot tell you how. I don't know what... The, I'm sure there are psychologists who could tell you why that works in that way. He got incredibly nervous and then was fine and was able to do it. Maybe it was only by being nervous that he had the power, as it were, to do what he then did on stage. 
Well, I would say from a psychological perspective is what he was doing is he was building himself up to like sports people do over a period of time so that the adrenaline is running and that the mind is getting sharper because of the adrenaline. Uh, and then what he has the ability to do is shift all that and anchor himself into his performance state. But he's at optimum you know, levels of concentration at that point. And and then it can be released. And that's that's extraordinary, that kind yeah, of power. Yeah. You may well be right. I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, we've reached the point in the show uh, which we like to call quick fire questions. Quick fire questions. <laughs> Who's the funniest business person that you've met? Oh, well, Jim Moyer, who used to be head of light entertainment at the BBC. What book makes you laugh, John? Currently, Mel Brooks, All About Me, My Remarkable Life in Show Business, written, as, as the blurb tells us, by a man currently 95 years old. Wow. He is an and, extraordinary uh, he, man. Yeah. And and I would I would say Woody Allen, despite all the sort of calumny that's thrown at him, a funny man, a seriously funny man, because he is both serious and funny. Actually, um, the, the Woody Allen book, the last one of his life, is actually his memoir. Um, yeah, then memoir is brilliant as well. Yes, it is very good. What film makes you laugh? Anything but Woody Allen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, a film I watch didn't watch it this year, curiously, but I I watch most Christmases is Love and Death, is Woody Allen's Love and Death, because even though I've bogged on about the how jokes aren't as important as they quite often think, that it it's the Woody Allen movie that has the best jokes. Uh, I recommend it. It's the one set in the uh, set in Russia during the Napoleonic War. It still makes me laugh. Let's take a shift to the other side now. Um, what is not funny? If I'm absolutely honest, I don't think that there are things which you can't uh, make funny. I, I, I'm, I. I'm a sort of serious proselytizer for that because I think, you know, there's a tendency amongst people to think, oh, no, I can't do jokes about that. If you get the joke right, you can do jokes about that. The, the problem is getting the joke. Well, do you, don't you think Ricky Chavez proves that to a, a, a large extent, um, that, that you can push the boundaries on anything. And it's it's, it, yeah. it's an intent, isn't it? Uh, exactly, it, yes. I, if the intent's right, there's a reasonable chance you'll get the gag right. Yeah. If the intent's wrong, then people will see that the intent's wrong and it will um, bomb, I think is the expression. I, I'm really interested in this because I, I got asked this when I was being interviewed on a radio show recently when somebody said, you know, you can't say anything anymore, can you? Comedy is dying. And I, 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 I no, went, have not. you seen Jimmy Carr's act? You know. <laughs> Quite right. It's not dying. It's, it, it's having constraints. Constraints put upon it, but but if it doesn't bother with those constraints, it's certainly not dying. No, I agree. What word makes you laugh, John? Possum. <laughs> okay. Possum. <laughs> I plucked it out of the air. I'm sorry. I apologise <laughs> to all possum owning pe people across the world. What sound makes you laugh? <laughs> Sorry, plosives are funny. Um, you know, one of the uh, I worked a bit from a, from university days with Rowan Atkinson, and Rowan has difficulty with some plosives and has to sort of, you know, it's, it's a thing he was born with. He has to get on top of plosives, and and hence Bob. Um, 
and and that is a very good example of somebody taking something which could be a handicap and making it into something that could be company gold. Well, we had Deborah Meaden from Dragon's Den on the show, and actually, her the sound that makes her laugh was um, uh, Rowan Atkinson saying the word Bob. Well, it was yeah, so specific. It's very specific uh, because he's he's when Richard writes scripts for Richard as uh, for Rowan as he used to and still does sometimes. There are words he knows he shouldn't include because R- Rowan will have problems with them. Wow! But it, and and you can he knows also that he can get that that something like Bob will get a laugh. <laughs> I, I've I've never seen somebody get a lot so many laughs out of one name. I know, I, and out of noises, ta. <laughs> yeah. It is genius. It is absolute yeah. genius. Would you rather be considered clever or funny, John? Funny. Hundred percent. Yeah, made a decision there. You know, if it's an alternative, I'd rather be clever and funny rather than clever or funny. But uh, funny, funny is the thing to hang on to. And finally, John, desert island gags. If oh. you could only take one joke with you to a desert island, what would that be? <laughs> well, I've already done it. My dog's got no nose out of the smell. It can't. Uh, <laughs> um... <laughs> I'll stick with that one. I'll stick with that one. There are others I, I'm, that drift through my mind and I quite rightly put away as possibly um, in very, very bad taste. But So I'll stick so, with uh, Well, would you like to tell us one that's in very bad taste and then we can decide if it stays in the edit? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's probably a wise decision, John. John <laughs> Plowman, thank you so much for thank being you. a wonderful, entertaining guest on the Humorology Not Podcast. At all. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having me. The Humorology Podcast was hosted by Paul Barros and produced by Simon Banks. Music by Steve Hayworth, creative direction by Les Hughes, and additional research by Helen Sykes. Please remember to subscribe, like, and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. This has been a Big Sky production.